Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Pat Jarrett, uh, Interim Director of the Virginia Folk Life Program. Thanks for joining us today for our latest installment of Folk Life Uncovered. Uh, before we get started today, I just want to uh, acknowledge the Monacan Nation, the original people of the land and waters of Charlottesville, Virginia, which is where we, uh, which is our home. Uh, today, uh, we are joined by Phil Wiggins, <laughs> and uh, we were we are showing a 2008 recording by Andy Garig. Uh, this is um, the last concert um, that Phil played with John Cephas. A um, little bit about the the series. Uh, the series um, is uh, uncovered from the vault where we are showcasing a digitized recording from our collection and uh, sharing it with you all. So uh, a couple of housekeeping uh, uh, items. Uh, there is a Q&A function. If you're in Zoom, feel free. If you have any questions, we'll be talking with Phil after we premiere this. And if you're on Facebook, say hi and tell us where you're from. Uh, we'll be looking there periodically to check for questions and uh, we're glad you're joining us today. Um, so uh, without further ado, I believe we're gonna be uh, starting this film. So uh, hang tight and we'll see you in uh, about a half hour. So sit back and enjoy the show. Pardon me, a little bit of a technical error there. Let me try this again. Pardon me.
immigration out of the south to northern cities all up and down the east coast they travel places like Richmond, Virginia, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, on up to New York, up into Connecticut, even up into Canada. But they came up to Delta as well. They went to Memphis, Tennessee. Many of them went on up to Chicago. And that journey, there was one writer that wrote about that journey traveling out of the South. They thought they was going up to places like Chicago, St. Louis, Memphis, Tennessee, to find better jobs, to find better opportunities, to find that pot of gold. And one writer was inclined to write about Illinois Blue.
I want to tell that big man. 
think we've got time to hear from one more. We'd like to thank each and every one for coming out of this evening. We hope we play something here this evening that has lifted your spirit and made you feel good. A lot of people think that the blues is all about being, being sad and talking about hard times and bad things. But the blues was intended to, to lift you up. One way of expressing yourself to reflect upon things that have happened in your life. And we hope that we have done that here for you. Thank you all each and every one for coming out here and supporting us. Thank you so much. Thank you. one song to, to celebrate, like a celebrational song, and um, you know, all through the set I've been thinking and thinking, and, and I couldn't really come up with one, but you know, this has been a celebration, this has been a true celebration in the true meaning of the word, hopefully, because when, when you celebrate because you really need to, then you wind up feeling rejuvenated, and I know that's the way I feel right now, and I hope that you feel the same way.
That was amazing, and uh, I, I I think that uh, that just made me kind of misty-eyed and, and uh, for live shows and and getting together with people you love and and experiencing music together. Uh, we're now joined by uh, uh, Phil Wiggins, uh, who you saw just there. <laughs> How you doing, Phil? I'm doing pretty good. Trying to get a handle on this technology. Aren't we all? It's it, it feels like we've been in this uh, for, forever and about 20 seconds at the same time. Like it feels yeah. like I'm so True. connected. Hey, well, it's, really the, the forever part is my hairdo. This is my pandemic. Uh, not safe to get a haircut hairdo. <laughs> hey, you're looking good, man. <laughs> Doing the best I can. Hey, you know, it was really the thing about this that I really love. And, and this, um, I'd like you to speak on this, is that with, with time, uh, a, a recording like this changes. You record it and then over time it changes. And we look back with this kind of nostalgia for it, you know, kind of build something different. When you're watching this footage, how are you feeling? Well, okay. Um, like, I think that, that first Skip James song that we played was one of my... I guess it was the first one, or maybe it was the second one. But it was one of my favorite songs to play with John because he played these crazy kind of random fills that over 35 years, I, I learned how to kind of double, even though we neither one of us knew where we were going exactly. And uh, and and not only double them, but then play play like a beat behind this sort of anticipate them. And, and, sitting here watching that today, it just makes me realize what, what I, you know, back when John passed away and, and um, it, you know, I always felt like oh, after 35 years playing with one person, I don't know if I have like enough time in my life to learn how to play with someone else. 
as well as John and I played together. So that's that's what I was experiencing today. Yeah, that's it was a really special connection. And I think that, you know, in I'm sure in the audience, everybody could feel it, but even watching that video, I could feel it too. You know, it's just that deep abiding relationship and building off that, that creativity. Um, yeah. What was he like as a friend? I mean, did you guys, you know, did you guys hang out? What was it like uh, kind of kind of meeting him and getting to know him and, and living with him? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting. I mean, that, and that dynamic changed over time. I mean, when, when I first met John, um, I was like maybe in my early 20s or maybe like late teens. And, you know, he was, he was kind of a, a generation that, older than me sort of and and so I mean I learned a lot from him he was like a mentor you know and and you know John he he had so many different life skills you know I mean he he was a carpenter he, he built his own house from from the ground up he you know I remember when I the first the first time I went down to spend a weekend with him and we were you know the plan was to you know, play some music together. And we wound up going like all over John's community. Um, we helped one guy sort potatoes and then we helped another guy drag out his 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 freezer to get it repaired. And, you know, I mean, we, we spent the whole day then we stopped somewhere and got a bushel of crabs. So we spent the whole day. We didn't get to play music till around midnight that night. But the thing I loved about that day was like, there was so much commerce going on and no money changing hands, just everybody trading on their skills. And, and John was, was like that, you know, um, as, as, you know, as, as we both got older and, and changed and all, we, we, we got to a point where we butted heads a good bit, you know, but, you know, through all that, I mean, you know, 35 years of partnership and, and like family. I mean, John was like family. His, and his family was like my family. I remember spending time with his his mother. His father was a was a, a, a minister among other things. But his father, by the time I met John, his father was uh, bedridden, and and John had him. He also built them a house down next to his house. And whenever you know, and they lived at Foggy Bottom. But on the weekends, especially when the weather was nice, they would go down to the home place. And I, you know, John's father would always be, you know, in, ensconced in the, in the back bedroom. And they would always say, you know, Phil, you got to go in and say hey uh, to uh, Dudley. And, and I would go and I, I loved talking to him. He was, he was a very kind of intellectual, be like, so I, I, he spoke like a well-educated man and he was just always interesting to talk to. And, and you know, it was always a, a great time, good celebration at John's house good, good uh, uh, food and, and all. And John, John though, at, at one point would always say, you know, that they, they, they go sitting here kicking up their heels and then they'll be sitting in church on Sunday acting like butter wouldn't melt in their mouth, you know? <laughs> it's like, so that, that whole dichotomy of, yeah. of the devil's music and church music, you know? Is well, it the same guy that, well, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, no, 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 yeah, I, I, it's interesting. You, you bring that up. Did, you got your start playing gospel music, didn't you? That when you were very young, before you met John, right? Well, I guess I guess you could say that because my, my first uh, serious plan was with a, a woman named Flora Moulton, who was a, a street musician in Washington, D.C. She, she was uh, blind and she played uh, gospel songs and she played songs that she called uh, truth songs, which were songs that she made herself. And they were all, th those songs were all about, you know, how to navigate through life, how to take care of yourself, how to, um, you know, st stand strong and, 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 and also be open-hearted and, sure. and, and go with like love and kindness, but also, you know, don't be, don't be anybody's victim. So those were what she called truth songs. And then a lot of them were her, her uh, just really traditional uh, gospel songs. Yeah, wow. And then you, of course, famously, not famously, maybe not, but you met uh, uh, John Cephas and uh, what, uh, Big Chief? Uh, Ellis, yeah, Ellis. Big Chief Ellis, yeah. 
Yeah, at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival in what, 1976, true. right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Wow. Yeah, that was great. I, I had I had become good friends with uh, Johnny Shines over my years of playing at the Smithsonian Festival. And he, he and I, we spent a lot of time hanging out and talking together. And I, uh, one conversation we had, you know, he was he was just like complimenting me on playing with four and all. And I, I was saying, well, you know, John, I, I love playing with her, but my main, uh, you know, love is is acoustic blues, not so much the gospel. And he said, well, you know, just just hang in there, you'll get your chance. And sure enough, he was the one that introduced me to John and Chief and and um, uh, Sunny Land Slim and you know a whole gang of us, Henry Towns, and were, were together on 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 the day that I met them, and we got into a nice jam session at the uh, Smithsonian Festival. And then later on that evening, I wound up going to the Child Herald and jamming with John and Chief and James Bellamy, which was their combo they called the Barrel House Rockers. Yeah. And at the end of that night, they invited me to join them. And I jumped in with both feet. <laughs> <laughs> Never looked back, huh? Yeah. Um, so um, this was a, a pretty, intimate gig uh the one we just watched from 2008 and if i'm not mistaken this is um it is uh the venue ashland coffee and tea that was right by where john lived right it wasn't too far away right well it wasn't too far you know that was yeah not not far at all because john lived in bowling green virginia which was like just the, that side of, of uh, Fredericksburg. And, then, and so the next, you know, so it was Fredericksburg and then Ashland and then Richmond. Sure. So yeah, so he was very close. But I, I, I love that gig myself because I, I could take the train there. And oh, the train yeah. station was like maybe a, a two blocks from the venue. And right behind the train station was this beautiful old hotel that I would stay in. So I could get off the plane I mean, the train and, and walk and check in, and put my stuff down and then walk over to the venue. And uh, as, you know, yeah, one of my favorite. You've been known to travel uh, to a lot of gigs around this whole country, but you, you tend to travel by, I, I seem to remember you like to travel by train. Oh uh, yeah, I love trains, yeah. And and, yeah. and you travel light too. So how, to, just, just, for, just for what for like, you know, how do you travel so light? When and what's uh, <laughs> and and what's the, what's the deal with trains? Do they just do they just speak to you or what? Well, you know, trains have been part of my life since I was a little kid. I so my my family is originally from uh, Titusville, Alabama, which is right outside of uh, Birmingham. And my my father now he passed away when I was seven. So a lot of my memories of him are like either like kind of faded or taking on superhuman qualities. But from what I understand, when he was a teenager, he worked in the train yards uh, at, at the Birmingham station. He had, he had a crescent-shaped scar on his head from when he was working in between trains and a train lurched and knocked him over and wow. hit, hit him in the head and he gave him this permanent scar. But, but so in the course of that, he became friends with all the, the Pullman porters and all the people that worked on the trains that went, ran from Birmingham to Washington, DC. And when I was a kid, they would put us on the train. We lived in DC, they would put us on the train. My, my oldest sister was the oldest one of us. She was like maybe 10 years old. They could put us on the train, me and my older sister, and my, I had one older brother and one younger brother. They could put us on the train and they would put us in a, in a Pullman, in, in a sleeper car for the first leg of the trip, because we'd get on the train in the evening and we'd get in the sleeper car. And then and then in the morning, we would be going through the mountains and we'd go to the, they had a skylight, they had a car with a glass roof where you oh, could nice. sit up there and, and, and see all the scenery. And uh, and so, so I, I, I love trains and I used to love to travel. And, and the Pullman porters and all knew my family. So that's why we were safe. <laughs> Perfect. being on that train just as kids well it's, yeah. it's something i heard about trains is like it's riding through the backyard of america uh, yeah it's it's really true and kind it's of, amazing it kind of also speaks to that you know you and john doing commerce without money it's you know being 
you know it's yeah. like it, it's it almost seems like another era but it seems you know kind of nice right now uh we had a question in the q a with how you travel how many harps do you carry to a typical gig i probably close to 50. <laughs> you're kidding me 50. yeah yeah i you know i yeah i have like a lot of, a lot of extras and and i have two two sets of i guess 12 mm -hmm. to cover all the different keys and 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 lately i've been using some some special tuned uh harmonicas you know since since i've been playing with the sheiks we've been doing a lot of kind of uh like swing standards and that kind of stuff yeah. and so I, I use these harps that are in what i call the melody maker tuning which i stole from uh lee oscar don't don't tell him but um your secret is safe with us <laughs> So, but they, so that those those particular ones make make some of those um, swing standards a little more accessible, and so so I carry them, yeah. But I carry a lot. Yeah. I mean, the, the the funny thing actually, this used to sort of piss me off a little bit because people used to say, you know, you're you're lucky you're the harmonica player because um, you get to travel so light. But what they didn't realize, John traveled with three guitars and and an amplifier, and guess who got to carry all them and at one point he decided to to build his own you know being a carpenter and all he decided to build his own uh guitar cases for for airplane travel and he used to joke and say now if they throw this one in the airplane it'll hurt the airplane before it hurts the guitar and and it was this extra thick plywood with these like metal corners and everything that each one of those guitars probably weighed about, with the case, probably weighed about 50 pounds. Oh, I'm so, so I didn't really travel as light as it seemed to other people. Yeah, <clears throat> dang. Well, that, you know, that's uh, that actually kind of leads into the, another question we had in the chat. Uh, Tom Mash asks, uh, what's the most interesting foreign gig uh, you and John played? I'm sure you guys played around the world. And, you know, where uh, were you lugging those heavy guitar cases? And tell me about uh, what your most interesting one was. Well, I have to say that tra traveling, doing a tour of Africa was a, a milestone for me. I never imagined that these little three inches of wood and tin would take me all the way to Africa. And wow. we visited what about, about eight, eight different countries in all kinds of different, um, different um, situations in terms of, you know, uh, in terms of of you know quality of venue. I remember we we played up on we had to go out a window in this one place and mm -hmm. climb up on this, this cement roof, which is where we, we played and it really wasn't that safe. <laughs> uh, but um but that was that was pretty amazing to me. And I got to meet uh E. T. Menza, who was mm -hmm. like the father of high life music. I got to meet him in Ghana and and high life music is pretty closely associated with you know Piedmont guitar. And it's it's it, the, the the guitar is very similar and and to be able to meet the man that that is is credited with creating that style of music was wow. pretty amazing to me uh, you know but i mean so many different places um you know traveling in in china uh be, being in beijing was was pretty amazing um good traveling in russia we we were like um we did a kind of a a, a trade um the uh, Russians sent a bunch of people to perform at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. Mm -hmm. And then the Smithsonian sent a bunch of us to Moscow wow. to, to play. And that was pretty amazing. I, di I didn't, I didn't, that whole, I think it was about a week we were there, maybe a little less, but I, I didn't sleep the whole time. Oh, we, we, yeah, we, uh, we spent so boys. much, yeah, we spent so much time hanging out and, and just meeting, you know, just local people. We stayed at we stayed at the uh, what do they call it the the Olympic uh, Village, uh, and and there was a guy Russian guy running what they called a shastlik kind of stand, which is basically uh, shish kebab. Oh yeah. Uh, so he was he was grilling all kinds of like questionable meat, <laughs> and, and and cooking it with stuff that he salvaged from from construction sites i mean so some of the wood he was burning had paint on it and oh yeah you know, but we sat there all night like drinking jack daniels and vodka and and sir solving the, the problems of the world you know, and I, i'd never and they 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 had me rooming with the guy 
uh, Simon, I forget his, his last name. He, he was a deaf soap folklorist. And mm -hmm. I snored really bad. So they figured he would be the only person that I could room with, that I wouldn't uh, ruin his sleep. And, and we did shifts. Like I would be coming to bed about seven in the morning and he'd be getting up. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. That, I need to room with that guy. I snore too. It's, 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 <laughs> it's a pretty huge, uh, pretty huge thing. Um, Phil, or, uh, you know, obviously you've played with some of these greats, and, and you've talked about um, uh, high life music and, and that's a, an amazing moment. I'm gonna catch up with you later about some of those records because I love that music and it's, oh, yeah. but I, I, I'm woefully uh, uh, under the stocked in high life records. So we'll have to talk about that. But um, yeah. my question for our Q&A that I also wonder is, you know, aside from high life or, or maybe that is, what, what are some of your musical inspirations? You have such a unique voice that you bring to the harmonica is it is it something that that you uh do you get it from somewhere or is it, you just feel the music and, and who inspires you and talk about that huh well that's that's a good, good question um i think that it, in a way like as i was like discovering the harmonica and experimenting and, and learning um I, I i was lucky or maybe stupid enough or maybe arrogant enough to want to to have my own style and to have my own and and but uh, but at the same time I'm like the the worst grand larcenist that you ever meet and so I mean I, I, I a, a lot of my phrasing I steal from singers you know starting starting with Flora I mean she was a great person to educate mm -hmm. to to have as as a a teacher in, in those mm -hmm. early stages. She was used to playing on the street and she would sing a verse. She, 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 in terms of chord changes on the guitar, she just kind of implied the changes more so than actually made them. But she was used to like playing on the street and stopping and saying thank you to somebody while she was playing. So you really had to listen carefully. Mm -hmm. And really the only kind of guide that I had was her voice. And I stole a lot or, or learned a lot from her voice. And then of course, being with uh, John, who's probably you know, one of the best singers, you know, that he could, you know, and it's stole a lot from that. Um, I also like my, my parents, uh, when I was little, collected a lot of uh, like piano records and kind of jazz records, uh, like a lot of New Orleans and that kind of stuff. So I stole, a, a, a lot of like the, the fast tongue and stuff that I do is stealing from the right hand of the piano. Oh. And, and then at the same time, you know, stole some phrases from people like uh, 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 Louis Armstrong oh, and sure. Bunk Johnson and, oh, yeah. you know, all those horn players, you know, stole some phrases from that. Amazing. And, That's some yeah. amazing American music there. And But one of the things that I really enjoy when I'm watching is you, use your hands and make so many shapes and it really forms a sound. I know yeah. a lot of people play directly into a microphone and yeah. you get that kind of distorted sound, but yeah. I've always seen you play with, you know, your hands do a lot of work up there. Could you talk about yeah. that in our, in our closing moments here? Uh, sure, yeah, I always, you know, I think of my hands as like a second mouth or a second set of lips that really shapes the sound as, as it's coming out and it's just, it's for me, it's just really fun to, I can get so many different sounds and shapes. And I, you know, I've, I've fooled with, you know, I have a green bullet and I have one of those little, a reissue of the uh, uh, Tinder basement, sure. but I, I get really frustrated. I've never really put a lot of time into that, but I felt really frustrated that I was only getting like one sound, that I wasn't able to get a variety of sounds. And I like to make the harmonic, I like to make it laugh and cry and speak and shout and and argue and and curse and beg and you know, all, all those different things you know you shapes you, sounds you can get uh using your hands yeah well it really comes through and i i love you know when i've seen you play before you you know these people like john played so smooth and the, the yeah. they're a lot of times you know they're i can see the lyricism i can see that you're kind of mimicking each other, but sometimes you go really hard on the rhythm and it really oh, yeah. 
adds a backbone to what you know in this oh, case yeah. john was playing and so yeah is there yeah. Some, some different technique for that but just just thinking of harmonica as percussion and I, I i love that i think that's one of the best jobs you you can do with harmonica it's yeah. just just slam that backbeat you know and, yeah. and, and and stay out of the way of the vocals that's it that's it. Now you're sounding like a bass player. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, but my other favorite thing to do on the harmonica, actually, like use my low D or my G and just crank out a just a straight up bass line. I love it, man. I love it. Well, cool. we we've had a, a, a lot of uh, a lot of comments here. We got a lot of love for your Phil, and and uh -huh. and I gotta say this was a treat to uh to, to to screen andy's film and i yeah. i believe andy grieg uh is going to be uh we're going to be working with him to possibly breathe some life into this project and uh, this recording and maybe do something bigger we don't know yet but we are thankful that he uh helped us with this and phil as always i'm so thankful for your presence and coming on today well thank you thank you so much for for being interested in anything i might have to say so I re really appreciate it. Yeah, man, most definitely. Well, you're welcome back anytime. And uh, we want to thank everybody out there who came and stuck around. This is uh, uh, Folk Life Uncovered from the Vault of the Virginia Folk Life Program. Uh, we're, uh, uh, we're here at Virginia Humanities. And uh, to those of you on the Zoom call, you'll be getting a little questionnaire. Just we're trying to figure out how we're doing, what we can improve, and we'd appreciate a response. And uh, We'll be doing this uh, next month, the last Tuesday of every month, we're doing a new recording. And I believe, uh, I hope we're gonna have um, something from Charlottesville uh, uh, next month with uh, hopefully um, some Allwells, uh, but we're, we're working on that. Ar Arn and Matthew Allwell had a performance that was just beautiful. So we're, I think we're gonna be rolling that, but stay tuned, uh, follow us on Facebook, follow our website and, uh, uh, thank you all for being here and everybody have a wonderful day. Thanks.